From Studio C in the 511 Studios in the Brewery District, located in downtown Columbus, Ohio, this is Note to Future Me. I'm Brett Johnson, owner of Circle 270 Media Podcast Consultants. Note to Future Me is dedicated to interviewing businesses and organizations who have implemented podcasting into their marketing strategy. In this episode, I talk with Dr. Todd Kays, host of Athletic Mind Institute Podcast, a podcast he produces for his sports and performance psychology practice, the Athletic Mind Institute. Dr. Kays is a leader in the field of sports and performance psychology. He's the co-author of Sports Psychology for Dummies, published in 2010. Dr. K's training and guidance have helped thousands of athletes eliminate the most common mental errors and breakdowns in sport. Uh, For five years, he was the sports psychologist for the Columbus Crew, the major league soccer team in Columbus, Ohio and has worked with numerous soccer players and coaches throughout the country. He has consulted with athletes and coaches from all different levels of sport, including National Football League, Major League Baseball, Major League Soccer, United States Tennis Association, Professional Golf Association, and Ladies Professional Golf Association. He also consults with teams at The Ohio State University. So he knows this stuff. (laughs) I know one great takeaway you'll get from the podcast is how Dr. K's passion for his students and performers overall, their well-being drives him to record episode after episode. If your business is using podcasting as a marketing or branding tool, I'd love to showcase your podcast on Note to Future Me. You can go to my website, notetofutureme.com, and scroll down to my booking calendar. You can find all this information in the show notes as well. I will have the full transcript of this podcast on the podcast website, notetofutureme.com, and at circle270media.com. And as always, thanks for taking notes with me. Well, before we get into the business side of the podcast, I wanted to give you some time and talk about a nonprofit that you support uh, with your time, talent, or treasure. Um, Let's talk a little bit about that nonprofit. Okay. Well, because I'm a cancer survivor, Mm -hmm. I certainly uh, support um, a lot of things related to cancer, all the way from writing in Pelotonia to donating uh, to various funds at, for example, the Ohio State University, Mm -hmm. their Cancer Research Center, and all the wonderful things they they do there, Um, as well as um, there's, you know, organizations here in town who help people who are coming from out of town um, to be treated for cancer, and sometimes they have to stay here for a number of days. And they don't have the money for for gas, food, for a place to stay. So it, most of my most of my nonprofit, I guess, dedication has been around uh, the the area of cancer, and and primarily the incentive was, you know, I had the personal incentive of being a cancer survivor. So um, I want to certainly give back and 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 help people certainly in the situation. Yeah, that tends to be where the help goes. I mean, I think we have various nonprofits that we help with, depending, but a lot of it does hinge, hinge on health-related mm-hmm. situations, Absolutely. whether it affected you directly or a family member mm-hmm. or a close friend mm-hmm. uh, and such. So it seems to be that's where it goes, which is great mm-hmm. uh, because that has the emotional tie. Exactly. You continue on and you advocate as well as exactly. we're doing right now. Mm-hmm. So yeah, great. Mm-hmm. So let's talk a little bit about your professional background and history, how you started your business. Mm-hmm. Well, I started my business. There was – in sports psychology, it was very new, newer when I was coming in uh, out of graduate school. The first sports psychologist that we had even with the United States Olympics was in 1988, Seoul, Korea. And I was in graduate school 1990. And so there wasn't a whole lot being done at that time. Um, I had found that about two years before, in, in, in when you do a doctorate, you have to do a year of, of internship. And so I found that Ohio State was doing something a little bit in the area of sports psychology. So I contacted them. Fortunately, they – gave me, you know, I, I earned the internship. And, and during that time, I also helped to build a fellowship program because there was no other fellowship programs in the country for 
postdoctoral people to get any training in sports psychology. Hmm. So it started there. And at that point, there were really no jobs uh, in the <laughs> mid-90s. You couldn't look up and find a job for sports psychologists needed. They're still very limited, believe it or not, across the country in, for example, large university settings. And so uh, about 1998, um, it was time for me to the, – the, the person at Ohio State, obviously – Far and few between jobs, he was going to stay there. And so I had to say, well, there's no jobs out there. And I had to either do something else or start my own practice. And so I started my own practice. And I guess this is 20 years now I've been in private practice. Did you have a mentor moving into that or knowing it was just wide open? I did not, in okay. fact. I, I read a lot. I talked to certain people, mm -hmm. but a specific mentor, no, because there really wasn't many people doing this at that time that on one hand it was exciting because you blaze your own trail. On the other side of things, I wish I could have mm -hmm. learned from somebody, maybe made fewer mistakes that I made, mm -hmm. but... I have more, I call them colleagues, but they're truly mentors because we um, go back and forth and we can share ideas and talk about our businesses, talk about growing practices all the way from a marketing perspective to how are you working with a professional team or how do you get into a certain college to help them understand the importance and the need for these types of services. Right. Did you have an uphill struggle in explaining what this was all about? Still do. Uh, what, and why it's important. You do. Wow. Still do. It's, it's much better. Okay. And I think people are understanding it more and more today. But I will speak – I will probably speak 30 to 40 times a year at different events. And one of my first questions is, how many have been exposed or worked with or understand sports psychology? And I would be lucky to still get 5 to 10% of them that would raise their hand. Hmm. And so to ask them, many will say, well, it's helping the mind with athletes. Okay. That's a very simplistic <laughs> view. But what exactly do you do? Very few people, even today – have a difficult time understanding until once I break it down for them, they're all in. They're like, mm. why didn't I do this 20 years ago? Why didn't I do this five years ago? Why didn't I get my son or daughter started in this, you know, when they entered high school or even middle school? Mm. Because, we, you know, we're all about developing positive habits, well, I'm helping develop positive mental habits. And there's a process to that. And there's a way to do that, that most people, when they read about sports psychology, it's very pie in the sky and airy. And it's like, well, yeah, that makes sense. I need to focus more. Well, to me, what's been exciting over the, particularly the past decade, is for me to show the process for people to actually strengthen their ability to focus. And when I make it real for them, when I demonstrate to them, when they have them do it, when they continue to do it and they start getting results, then they're like, oh, the light bulb <laughs> the goes aha off. Moment. Yeah. <laughs> I like how on your website you've also, well, in, in, in your practice, you've expanded into even musicians. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I love that aspect of it going, well, sure, it's – a competition in a different form, mm -hmm. or it's still a mental game. Absolutely. I mean, when I first started in the sports, I, I, my personality, I like variety, but that, and that's a part of the reason I wanted to start my own business is because I wanted to do a number of different things. Um, and so I wanted to write. I wanted to consult to various organizations. I wanted to do clinical counseling. I also wanted to do performance consulting. And so it was actually 
in the late 90s when I started my practice where I realized that everything we do in life is a performance. And it really started rolling when I had a a fairly high executive at a large company here in town came to me and said, the performance that you're teaching my son in golf, he goes, my staff need this. And he goes, does that make sense to you? I said, perfectly. And so that was kind of changed real early that, you know, I've been able to work with a broad uh, scheme of people and which is to me part of my personality is I love the variety. And so the musicians came about is more so when we had the financial crisis in 2008 that they were going to close the symphony. And most of these people, once you get a symphony job, you stay there. And most of these people had been there 15, 20, sometimes 30 years. They had not auditioned in that long. And now all of a sudden, they're out of a job and they have to go and they have to audition, which they haven't done for years. And so the anxiety, the worry, certainly the stress of losing a job, certainly the financial stress, how am I going to support my family, all of those sorts of things. So I've got a flood of people from the Columbus Symphony saying, I am so nervous. I've played the French horn. I played the flute for 30 years, and I can barely play now because I'm so nervous about the upcoming auditions. And it was, and it still is. I still consult to a lot of musicians, and it's a fascinating group to work with. Wow, that's interesting that it, it turned into the loss of job and, and having to re-audition mm-hmm. rather than the performance skills and just keeping up their level of play. It's just survival mode. Correct. Desperation sometimes leads us to do things. Yeah. So why a podcast? Well, it certainly wasn't something I started out doing. And in fact, I work with a lot of younger people, um, partly out of choice because they keep my mind young. They keep me sharp. And so there's a number of different people I work with who um, – work with teams, let's say a golf professional, a golf fitness specialist, and then myself. And for example, they'll be young. They're always Instagram, Twitter, everything is just constant 24 seven for them. And I kind of learned from that. I was like, well, I thought it was really cool what they were doing, but I didn't know much about it. And so, but I saw enough. I was smart enough to realize this is the future. And so I literally just thought, well, the young people, that's what they want to work with. And the majority of people, at least from the athletic realm that I work with, are 30 and under. And as young as 10, 11, 12, they have their phones always with them. They are used to podcasts. They are used to social media. And so that was part of the incentive was this is really a part of the business that has to grow. The other part for me was they can actually have my advice, my guidance, my sometimes voice with them 24-7. And it's very helpful to them. It's in some ways more affordable. And the, the, where my heart was, was I can change more people's lives. Mm. All right. So who was all involved at the very beginning? Was it just yourself thinking about this or did you bring some team members in going, Hey, I'm, going to do this and just lay it on the table and get some input from people around you? No, it was just myself. Okay. I just started. And um, at the beginning, I kind of scripted things Mm -hmm. and I would listen to them. And honestly, I have to say, I didn't listen to them that closely. I was like, oh, that's good enough. Let's just get it out. Mm -hmm. And, but I scripted things, but then I, I learned, boy, this is taking me a long time. 
script it and then go over it. And then, and I was like, that's not me. It didn't even sound like me. It sounded too forced. And I was trying to almost like teach like I would in the beginning when I first started teaching at the college level. I would have very prepared presentations. But then I learned over time that what did the students really like? And they loved how I was just interactive. I was with them. I was just talking with them. I was asking them questions. And it was telling them stories, giving them images. And so that's when I just started saying, okay, I am just going to start talking. And I don't know what's going to come out. I'm just going to stay with this topic. And and over the years, it's gotten better. I still am refining because I'm really taking my podcast to a whole different level now. And so now I'm in the process of getting other people involved where they're listening. They're giving me feedback. I'm trying to structure it. I'm trying to understand the time. What is the maximum or minimum time that somebody will listen to a podcast, particularly my audience. I'm finding that they love two to three minutes. Hmm. And then I'm finding adults who are fine with 20 minutes and they will sit down and they hmm. really enjoy the intellectual part and love learning. So I'm, I'm learning about that as we speak. So from first thoughts, to the first episode, how long of a process was that discussion in your mind to do the podcast? It wasn't long. Okay. I think I just saw young people doing it. It took me a long time to write. I enjoy writing, but it always took me a long time. The perfectionist in me would come out. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm looking at all these young people and – I'm hearing other podcasts. I'm just like, why not? So I literally just sat down on my computer and just did it. And I sent it out to my email database. And I was like, wow, people are actually listening to this. <laughs> and it was easy and it was fun. Mm -hmm. And then I just kind of keep learning, refining, changing, you know, obviously my approach my knowledge, my experience, my expertise is a lot different than it was 20 years ago. And so I can add different takes on something that I might have taught very differently 10 years ago. Right. You have the student experience that maybe in the classroom wasn't quite the same as in real life, but there were pieces that were similar. Sure. Absolutely. Sure. Absolutely. Were you thinking of return on investment or a return on uh, influence when you first started? How are you going to measure that this was working for you? Because it does take a little time. As you said at the very beginning, you were scripting. So obviously a lot more time than you're doing now. Mm -hmm. But it does have that dedication of open mic, record, is it worth my time? Were you putting some factors in your mind on what you thought, how long you're going to give this I would like to say that I was an astute business person at the time and had any thought of that, but I did not. I and there is no did wrong not. answer to that. It, it, it doesn't matter. i just curious. Some people say the exact same things. Like, no, I just knew it was the right thing to do. That, that's what it was for me. Yeah. I knew it was something I wanted to try. One of the things that I love about, and I, and I truly try to capture every week and I'm getting better, is, is my, the creativity part. And running a business – has been a challenge for any small business person. But when you're trying to do and you're wearing multiple hats, it's hard to do what you're really, really good at, maybe passionate about, but at the same time, you have to run a business. And so the podcast for me began as more, it was so, it was tapping into my creativity. It was tapping into my heart, which I was like, this is fun. And I looked forward to doing it as opposed to sitting down and writing something that and then analyzing it and then researching it, I was like, this is fun and I'm getting good feedback from at least the student athletes or the athletes at the time who were giving me feedback. They were saying, this is really good. I love this. And so I knew I had something. But until honestly recently is the first time 
that I've even thought about, okay, you know, and that was on the advice of another business person who said, you've got some great content and I know that you lead with your heart, he told me, but I'm a business person. And he said, just some advice. Mm -hmm. He goes, you can use some free things, but he goes, this is really good stuff. And I would encourage you to kind of look at it as, as he said, maybe a yearly membership because you could touch people all over the world for a very small price. And you deserve to get paid for what your years of experience and what you're giving out. And so it wasn't my idea. And I'm still honestly getting used to the idea Mm -hmm. of running it like that. But I'm using him as a mentor to help me. I think a lot of podcasters look at it that way as well, too, that you're giving it away for free. That was the total intent initially. Mm -hmm. He's like, yes, I'm branding myself. I'm getting out this information. But is my information, is my content worth anything to anyone? Mm -hmm. And then you start working at that price point going, okay, what is this? And you can only play with it and kind of figure out where the ouch point is Mm -hmm. and get a feel from the email database. Would you pay for this? Would you, how much would you, the range and such? Um, but I think that's where uh, business podcasting will probably have to go a little bit more because then you have these different levels of listeners of engagement mm-hmm. as well, mm-hmm. still remaining free because that's what podcasting ultimately is. Uh, but there, I think we'll have an expectation that there'll be memberships correct, to have deeper content access to you in a different way mm-hmm. as well, too, mm-hmm. that you may be not in Dublin, Ohio, but Dublin, Ireland. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I can talk to Dr. Kays <laughs> because I'm part of Absolutely. the membership and mm-hmm. such, too. Sure. Absolutely. So the podcast itself is it's it's showcasing your your sport and performance psychology expertise. How are you allowing it to do that? When you first scripted, you were writing these ideas down, but now as that business owner said, do you lead with your heart? When you open your mic, where is it coming from? How are you doing this? Is it topics in mind that you think, okay, I do want to cover this, 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 and this? Or how is it coming to you? It, it really comes to me based on all of the work I'm doing. So, for example, if I'm working with, which, you know, I have, I have a number of professional athletes. They're very different and have different challenges to a college student athlete, to a high school student athlete, to a middle school student athlete, to the parents, to the coaches. So it's, for example, a lot of times what I'm hearing, seeing in my current practice at any given time. Recently, uh, in the past two months, just right here in central Ohio, there were a number of student athlete suicides. And so immediately I thought this has got to be addressed. And so immediately that day, because I had literally that day when the third one occurred, I had calls from three different colleges for me to come out and speak. And so I said, okay, this, this is real life stuff. Winning a game. That's wonderful, but it's a game. This was real life stuff. So I immediately started writing and getting this out saying, we have to look at student athletes do have depression, do have anxiety, do have clinical issues just like everybody else. And we can't think that just because they're on TV or they appear to be 26 year old when they're really only 18 years old and Sometimes they're only emotionally about 15 or 16. We can't expect that. So in that way, that's what, you know, I led that. But I consistently hear distraction. And why do we have distraction? Well, partly it's because of young high school students constantly being on social media and the distraction that creates. So I said, okay. I've got to develop not only podcasts, but I want to develop in the process of developing a video course. You want to learn how to quiet your mind. These are the things you need to do. 
And so it's really just based on the trends that I'm seeing and that I'm hearing from student athletes, athletes every single day. And so I kind of let that guide what I'm doing and what I'm going to choose to discuss. I know a lot of businesses want to add content to their website, but they're also pulling back on, okay, we don't want to slap everything up there because it starts messing with the look of the website and where do we put it as a new tab, this, that, and the other. So have you seen adding content to your website, the podcast content, uh, increase some traffic to your website as well? It is increasing uh, some traffic. And I think what I'm getting more of besides the traffic is that I will hear kids and their parents, for example, of young athletes. I will hear them. They will literally come up to me and say, love the podcast. That was so spot on. Whereas when I was writing newsletters and papers, I wouldn't get that as much. But I do think it's the day and age that – I'm not saying because it's, it's a good thing, but – we're a very rushed society, and people want things quickly and want things on the run. Now, my whole premise when I've done these podcasts is these aren't quick fixes. It's when I give, for example, mental training drills. A mental training drill to a team of student athletes might be, you're going to listen to this three-minute podcast, but then you're going to journal about it for seven minutes. And so I want them to, again, slow down. But we're in a world. They have access to it. And so they have people recognizing my name, for example. I'll show up to speak somewhere, and a student athlete who I've never met before will say, hey, a friend of mine shared your podcast with me. They're really good. I'm like, cool, that's, that's great. And I'm just, for me, that's awesome. If, if he's kind of listening to something, that means to me he's opening his mind to developing positive mental habits well beyond sports because I realized that I'm not in this, never was in this business to make professional athletes. I was in this business to help people be successful in life. And I realized that there's only a tiny percentage that will ever make a career in professional sports. But if I can help them develop these habits that are going to make their family successful, they're going to be a successful mom or a successful dad someday or a successful business owner or agent or teacher or physician, whatever. That's what this is really about. Yeah, that's great. So let's get down into the the nitty gritty uh, in regards to you know your your publishing schedule strategy. Uh, when you first started, were you thinking I'm going to do this monthly, every other week, weekly, daily? Uh, what did you initially start out as? And are you still continuing that? How did how has that evolved in regards to your schedule strategy? It evolved most of the time in the beginning as something struck my heart, and I just did it. And I sat down and I did it. And a lot of times I didn't know what to do with it. It just sat there because I didn't exactly know. Um, because I'm not one to, I was worried, maybe uh, not worried, but concerned about if I would bombard all of the people that were in kind of my, my database who have had relationships with me or have signed up for newsletters and things like that. I didn't want to bombard them with them. And I really didn't know. Mm -hmm. they Did they really want to listen to these? And so I was very slow at first. So I, I kept a bank of them. And then would slowly put them out maybe once a month, honestly, maybe twice a month. And it was very haphazard. And I, I would have to say in the last couple of years of doing this, even though I have over probably 400 podcasts made, only a small few of them have been sent out. 
Now, with the help of a business mentor, I'm kind of starting to understand, okay, this is how you should be doing this. This has to have more of a consistent structure to it. And whether, again, I make any money, I have no idea. But if it helps people, and I do know that people may not purchase the podcast, but I do know that it touches people and I do get calls saying, hey, I heard your podcast. My son is really struggling, really wants to play at the college level, really gets anxious before competitions. Is this something you can help with? Mm. Absolutely. You mentioned an email strategy at the very beginning. You incorporated at least the very first ones in your email as a delivery system. Still incorporating those in your emails um, as well? Yes. uh, The email system for me has been the best. Honestly, when I look over the years, it's still better than Instagram, um, which I've been using for the past particularly year, year and a half, maybe two years. The email has always been the best from my standpoint. So all of these other forms of social media and could be because I'm not using them correctly or maximizing their benefit. But it seems that people are in front of their emails, at least adults, who in some ways understand the importance if we look at sports psychology and athletics. They understand it more because simply they're older. They have more wisdom. A 12, 15, 16 year old, not necessarily going to understand it. They like the podcast because it's cool. It's something they can listen to. They will listen to it in the locker room. Whereas a parent will get the email and they'll say, wow, this is valuable stuff. And then possibly give me a call or try to get in touch with me about speaking to their team or or um, speaking to their club or whatever the case might be. Mm-hmm. Instagram as well as podcasting is fairly artwork heavy. Um, what's your strategy? How do you create this artwork that you're using, especially for Instagram? Well, I've recently found an app and I th- it's called Canva. Mm-hmm. And it makes Instagram a little bit more easy. Now, I was just doing it this morning because I have a big mental training program coming up. And the young people around me say, you got to get this on Instagram. So I say, okay. Um, And one of my friends slash, and he's in a completely different discipline, he exposed me to this. And it took me probably this morning an hour And I sent it to him. I said, what do you think? He said, looks great. How long did it take you? I said, an hour. He said, why didn't you just tell me? I could have done it in five minutes. And I said, okay, if you're serious, I'm going to do that. But at the same time, I am truly the creative part of me. I'm truly enjoying listening and learning about all these things that are are going on. It's, It's fun, actually, for me to learn about different companies that do different things with podcasts, how Instagram works and how they interact with all the others. Right. I'm actually enjoying learning about it. Yeah. I'm yeah. just a little slow. And I'm in the same boat. I, uh, it, it does tend to bring the creativity out of you, especially with as easy as those apps are anymore. Canva really does make it easy. There are mm-hmm. probably five more out there that we don't even know about mm-hmm. um, or don't remember at this point in time, but they do make it pretty easy to come up with some very eye-friendly graphics mm-hmm. and, and, and for podcasting, mm-hmm. and especially for Instagram, because that's very heavy visual art <laughs> mm-hmm. for Instagram compared Absolutely. to a, a Facebook or a Twitter. Um, you've got to, it's, it's still that thumb roll. You've got to catch the eye of that user and, and that artwork has to do it for you. Right. And I have found, and that's where I will, again, extending outside of my comfort zone. I do think, um, and I'm getting better at it, but I'm having like a photographer 
she comes out and she just takes pictures, live pictures of me. It might be speaking. It might be interacting with a team. It might be working one-on-one because I do think those live pictures, I like them better because they're truly me. They're truly what we're doing. And and it's not just uh, clip art or stock images that I do think that draws more of a personal touch. To and it. that is Instagram yes. right there. That is Instagram. Instagram loves that. I mm-hmm. took this picture and I'm posting it mm-hmm. sort of feel to it. Or I think the other platforms are tending to be stock photo. Mm-hmm. But nothing wrong with that. It just comes down to that's the flavor of Instagram. That's the way it is. Why did you choose SoundCloud as a, a, a platform to post your audio on? Well, this is to my lack of inc- my 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 lack of knowledge. I honestly these files, all these four hundred podcasts, I didn't know what to do with them, mm-hmm. and they were big, and I honestly didn't know how to share them and get them back and forth. And I I was sending them through email to clients. I would say here I'm gonna, and I would find it because I would have one in mind or two in mind after working with one of my athletes, and I'd say, I want you to listen to these couple of podcasts that I did. I think they hit on exactly what we were talking about today. And I just, again, it's another form of learning. It's every time you listen to a podcast, it's mental training. You are training positive mental habits just by listening to it. And so I tried um, doing that, but it was so tedious. And it was taking me so long. I'm like, there's got to be a wet, better way. And literally, a young person said, well, what about SoundCloud? And I looked, and there's, from the medium I use to do my podcast, there's a direct link, oh, lo and behold, to SoundCloud. And I was like, wow, that was easy. And so I think right now I have about, I decided at that time, I said, well, I, I think I might have 100, 120 maybe on SoundCloud now. And I just think, wow, it's easy. And people are ex- accessing them. And I get feedback from, hey, you have a new follower or so-and-so like this. I have no idea who they are. And I'm still trying to understand that whole process. But but I'm like, this is kind of neat. And it's you know, now you can't, as I've learned from a business side, and that's what I'm kind of grappling with as a business owner, is that they cannot on SoundCloud, you can't sell. And so that's when I'm trying to explore these other means. If I, in fact, do go that route, I may just stay with, I just enjoy doing these. And if it, you know, continues to get the word out and people grow from it and certainly from a marketing standpoint they get to know what we do at my practice and we have growth that way that's wonderful because at least in my mind I don't look at podcasts and maybe I could be completely wrong as going to help me retire I just look at it as all right this is more of a easy marketing. At least that's the way I've looked at it. Now, I could be wrong and I could learn from other people that this is a viable income stream. Whether I want to make it that or not, that'll be my decision down the line. Um, But at least I'm exploring the options because the one thing they do not teach you in psychology or graduate school is how to run a business. (laughs) And so I'm learning I've had to rely on business owners to teach me and learn from them because I just, it's not something that comes natural to me. I think podcasting, it's not in its infancy, but it is in its infancy in the monetization piece to it. Mm -hmm. But what's so fun about it is you can monetize this in any way you want and at any time that you want. So you're right on task that, You walked into it with the right mindset. You're doing it for the love of it, for the end user, and for your business, obviously, Mm -hmm. as well, too. But are there opportunities down the road? Sure, when it's the right time, Mm -hmm. when you feel comfortable in doing what you want to do with it. Mm -hmm. And it sounds as though you've set that up quite well. Mm -hmm. Your equipment setup, how are you doing this in your office? 
I literally um, use my Apple computer, and I do have a mic that I don't just do it over the computer. I have learned that the sound quality is better and that I just simply do it that way. Um, and I do some editing uh, because I'm tinkering around with putting intro music, putting a specific closing. But those are in the beginning stages. And those, from my standpoint, I'm just learning those. And those are, for me, time-intensive. Hmm. I could send them to somebody else and it would take them 15 minutes. What well, would take me three hours? So I'm tinkering around. But most of the time, I just put my uh, microphone with the, 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 the um, to incorporate sound the best. Hmm. I'm sure it's not anything like professional equipment, but it's at least inexpensive right now. If it continues to grow, I certainly would not be opposed at all to doing it more on a professional level with graphics and things of that nature, which is, I think, ultimately, it's not, it, it is ultimately what I want to do because I cannot be, I can be in front of one person or one team at a time. And so my time is limited, and that's the greatest asset I have right now. And so in addition to hiring a couple other qualified people, it is a way to get in front of people. And I want to give them the best, Mm -hmm. uh, at least as best as I can. And so if somebody is paying for a service or a product, I want it to be high quality. And so my assumption is I'm going to step that up into a more professional arena such as this, such as somebody doing the graphics and things like that. I can do what I'm really, really good at and what I love. They can do what they're good at. And that's kind of the whole basis of kind of a team in sports is coaches, you coach your position, players, you play your position. Don't worry about the guy next to you. Don't worry about the guy across from you. You have no control. You just do the best you can at your craft. That's all you need to do. And I need to take my own advice on that. And so I'm getting there. I think you looked at it in the best way. I, I know a lot of people, and you hear these stories of businesses or individuals, whoever it might be, that look at the equipment options. <laughs> Let's put it that way. And it, it it's it just freezes them up. Where should I go? What should I buy? And the advice always given is just do it. You can always buy the USB mic in two or three weeks if you don't like the sound of just recording yourself on on the Mac computer. And you can always change the room you're in if you don't like the room ambiance, but you have to start first. Otherwise, you'll never know what's comfortable for you. Mm -hmm. And I think you've taken the right approach step by step by step. You jumped in. You did it for the right reason. Mm -hmm to get going. You mentioned a little bit about future plans without laying out you know, specifics and giving away the farm or anything like that. What, what are the future plans for the podcast? Where are you thinking about going with this? I, you know, we mentioned a little bit about in regards to the membership level, but uh, also where are you going with the concept itself with the podcast? Well, I, I will, I will continue to do podcasts simply because I really mm-hmm. enjoy doing them first and foremost. I would like to see them grow, and I want to see my own. First off, I want to see two things happen. One is I want to see my own abilities to do podcasts improve. So the podcasts that I'm doing now, I'm sending them out to a number of trusted people, and I say, give me every piece of feedback that you can give me. And I have learned so much in just the past 30 days because they've been giving me honest feedback about what's really good and how I can sharpen my own skills to, for example, get to the point or you're talking about too many points in this five minutes. You need to just choose one of these points. So that's the first thing that I'm doing. The second thing is is to get and learn with other professionals who are 
good at this and this is what they do to help me along this process because I do want to, if I'm going to put a product out, and particularly I haven't probably worried about it as much because it was just something fun and I thought it was helping people. And I really didn't think much beyond it. But if it gets to a point where I choose to say, hey, this is something that could reach out worldwide and I start getting that sort of feedback, I really want to have the best product and the best visuals, the best sound. Um, I want it to be very professionally done and that a person's going to know that, hey, this was not just done in his home office while he was sitting watching TV. This was truly done with a lot of forethought. And then they feel that, hey, this, if it is a yearly membership, this was worth it because this is a high quality product. And I ha- I've always held high standards for myself. And I think I'm at that place where I was rushing. I honestly say I was rushing ahead with these podcasts. And it was my wife who said, slow down. You're throwing a lot of things out there. And the reason that you're a little stressed is because that's not you. You're more methodical. You're high quality. Slow things down and start doing things the way you know they should be done. And so that's, it was kind of odd that you had called me to do this because I'm just in that process of thinking about all these mm-hmm. things right Interesting. now. That's good. So what advice would you give to any business that comes to you? Love your podcast, love what you're doing. Heard your interview on Note to Future Me. <laughs> um, what advice would you give to a business that is considering this as a marketing tool, a podcast? Well, I, w- I would first say make sure that you truly want to do it. Make sure that this is something that you're speaking from your heart and you're not doing it to simply make money and jump on this trend, or I shouldn't say it's a trend, this new medium we're using to get information out. I would say that it has to be certainly something you truly believe in and you have a desire to truly get your message across, whatever that message might be, if it's financial, if it's if it's psychological, if it's you know uh, legal, whatever the case might be, I would say that would be my first thing. And then the second thing is I would say just start doing it, practicing. But the thing I would do that I didn't do at first, give it to some people. Just have them listen to it first before you just send out because you may not know what you just did if you don't listen to it. And you may have some background noise that you didn't even realize. And then it comes across as, well, I'm not going to listen to that person again because that sounded like he was, you know, in an airport while he was doing his podcast. I don't want to listen to that. So, but I, I would say that is really want to do it and feel passionate in your heart about your message. But then, like you were saying earlier, just jump in and try it and do it. And then just keep refining the skills around it and use a support team, as I'm learning a lot sooner than I have, is to rely on video experts, rely on audio experts, rely on social media experts. Let them help you along the way because it will be a much better product and ultimately you'll get to do what you're good at and you'll allow them to do what they're good at. Thank you for being a guest on on my podcast. I appreciate it. The insight you've given is dead on. And I think we read a lot about this in Facebook posts and groups for podcasters and such, but I, 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 I think it comes off more genuine when you hear somebody talk about it and through their experiences. And that is exactly what the focus of, of this podcast is. And I, um, I, I love that you're the grassroots piece of this podcast, what you're doing with it and learning over now over 400 episodes, maybe only half published, but at the same time, you've got them in a bank and you're ready to do, and you're looking to the future as well. 
with what you're doing with this. I, I think it's exciting as well that it continues to evolve with what you want to do with it. And, and again, thank you for being a guest. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you for having me. And just by being here and you forcing kind of me to answer, not, not forcing me to answer these questions, but putting these questions in front of me really forced me to, again, really think about what my next steps are and really solidify them in my own mind. So I appreciate that. And um, I definitely will be listening to your podcast because these are the exact things I need to learn. And I look forward to hearing other people's perspectives and learning from them what they're doing so maybe I can prevent my own mistakes or just find a way to do things more efficiently or find people who can help me do things more efficiently. 